Um, above me is the yin and the yang symbol. And I'm going to explain to you how this has become part of my identity. And I'm going to explain how I hope it will contribute to your identity as well. So when we look at the yin and the yang symbol, uh, a lot of us see it maybe daily on people's clothing, maybe even on a tattoo. I'm not sure if everyone really understands its daily function in our lives. So I'm not a Taoist scholar. I'm not going to pretend to be a Taoist scholar. I look at this yin and this yang symbol as um, something that we can respond to daily, that can become part of our heart and our soul. So in layman's terms, the yin and the yang kind of contemplate like this. The yin is more the feminine. It's um, more coldness, stillness. It's more like the moon, where the yang is more activity. It's more productivity. It's more like the sun, the fire, and the masculine. So I hope this slide actually assists you in kind of understanding where I'm coming from today when it comes to yin and yang. One of the things that I like to think about with yin and yang, yin is actually the inhale, and yang is the exhale. And one thing I like to think about when I think about the inhale and the exhale is college football. And <laughs> I know that seems strange, but I am a big Auburn Tiger fan. I love SEC collegiate football. And <laughs> no, Auburn is great. Um, <laughs> I heard a boo in the audience. Um, but um, what I like to think about when it comes to the inhale in college football is we inhale and we hold it for that big play, right? We're holding it because we're praying that our team does what we hope they will do. We're waiting, waiting to marvel at something. We're waiting to see their creativity. What creative play is going to happen? And then the exhale <sighs> comes our activity, yelling at the ref, yelling at the coach, celebrating for our team. So that's just an easy way to think about yin and yang. Yin is about creativity, it's about nurturing, it's about wanting to marvel at something and seeing that creativity happen. So I'll tell you a little bit about my personal journey with yin and yang. So I realized as a yoga teacher that I should be in balance all the time, but I'm not. I'm very rarely in balance. I think the busyness of our lives kind of gets in the way and sometimes it gets in the way of our own creativity and actually who we are as people. So I realized that I needed to find activities in my daily life to counteract all that busyness that happens every day with us. Filling out forms at work, running kids all over the place, um, doing our taxes, you know, making sure our bills are paid. All of those things live more in the yang. They're very productive, they're very essential, but they don't define who we are as people. So we need those, that stillness, those yang, I'm mean, sorry, those yin activities to make us pause into that stillness and really define who we are in our creative selves. So I do yoga, and that helps me with my yin. That helps me balance into my yin and find my place in the world. But yoga isn't quite enough for me. I find that I need yin activities on a continual basis, and I need to explore my opportunities to find those yin activities. It can't just be one thing. It's an exploration through my whole life. I want multiple yin activities because I have multiple yang activities, and I want that balance. So not only do I do yoga, but I also went to Vipassana meditation training. And for those of you who are not familiar with Vipassana meditation, it's quite intense when you first learn how to do it. So um, I went to a retreat center, and you cannot talk for 10 days. You can't read, you can't write, uh, you can't listen to music, there's no computers, there's no cell phones. It's you, it's your thoughts, and you're cultivating this meditation practice. And it was very hard. I'm not gonna pretend like it wasn't. And I will say my hardness came on the even days. <laughs> so day two, day four, day six. Once I hit day six though, I felt really good inside of the space and learning the process. And when I came home from my Vipassana meditation, I felt fabulous. And what that told me about myself was that I was way, way too much in my yang. I was way too much in my busyness. And I needed that break. 
I needed that space in order to balance myself. So I felt great for a couple weeks. And then again, the yang comes into your vision. Here it comes. And it kind of took over again. And I realized, again, I need more than just one activity to help balance me. I need multiple. And so out of that, I started to do yin yoga. And this is a picture of me doing some yin yoga. So yin yoga, unlike vigorous yang yoga, is where you hold poses for a good three to five minutes and you breathe inside of them. And this is a good example, the slide is a good example of a, of a common yin pose. So you're breathing into your thigh in this pose and you're letting things come up in your body, you're letting things come up in your mind, and you're breathing through them. And you're not cutting and running if it gets hard. You're staying in noble stillness and exploring yourself. So in doing that, I realized, great, I have found another activity that I love that puts me in my yin. So I practice yin yoga, I teach yin yoga, and I love doing it. But again, it wasn't quite enough, right? Life goes on and things get in the way and that big yang whiteness comes toward you and you realize you need something else. So one night, I was watching a B documentary for my master's degree, and it hit me that bees are essential to our natural environment. And it hit me that bees are in crisis, and there's something you know, that we need to do as a society for the bees. And I didn't relate it to yin at that point. I really didn't. I just thought, hey, as a budding environmentalist, I need to get bees. <laughs> and it was that simple. So budding environmentalist, I need to get bees. So I made a plan. At the end of my master's degree, once I got my diploma, I would seek out a beekeeping class. And by that spring, I would have my first hive. And this is me hiving my first hive. Actually, I'm not in the photo. But this is right after I put the lid down on my very first hive of bees. And they're all over the place. And they're beautiful. And I realized in that moment, this is another yin activity. Because it takes a lot of yang to decide to get bees. You, gotta get, you have courage, right? You're, you're harnessing this you know, wild beast, maybe, in your mind, like you know, a big swarm or colony of bees. But as I stood there and watched those bees and interacted with those bees, I realized I couldn't be in my yang. I couldn't be like this around bees, right? I needed to be like this. And I needed to be like this. So there are moments when I'm working with my bees where I feel like my yang is taking over and I just step back for a moment and I just let them do their thing. Because I am not a savior of bees. I am an assistant to bees. I am assisting them. They are these beautiful creatures that have great reciprocity with the earth, and I am just there to witness and to assist. I am not there to be part of the, the colony. Again, I'm a witness to their beauty. So here is another picture of another one of my bees above a flower. And this just kind of represents that yin and that yang, that reciprocity of yin and yang, that balance, that giving, that beauty. Um, and, and bees do that. And if we sit back again and inhale and marvel at those bees, great things happen, or great things happen for me. So it makes me feel so wonderful to be in that space. So I challenge you, what is your activities? What are your activities that will take you away from your form filling out, from your taxes, from your bill paying, from running kids around town? All of those things are getting very important. But what helps you in your stillness? What helps you balance out those activities? Where can you find that peace? So I will um, mention Michael Pollan for a minute. Michael Pollan is a food historian. He's a Berkeley professor. He writes a lot of books about food and the history of food. He actually bakes bread. 
And he actually watches the bread rise. He has no expectations that the bread is going to be perfect. He does it because it gets him into his yin space. He can marvel at the science of baking bread. Um, Tom Montgomery Fate, he wrote the book Cabin Fever. He's a busy professor as well, has two kids. Um, he has a cabin outside of town where he drives every other weekend or so, and he lives like Thoreau, and he watches nature, and he's a witness to the nature around him, and he writes, and that is the way that he balances. Francis Malman, he is a Pentagonian chef. He goes out into the wild as well, and he learns from fire, and he learns from wind, and he learns from water. And when he goes back into his kitchen and becomes this great chef, he, his dishes are in correspondence with that exit, with that ability to move into the creative. So I ask you again, what are your activities? Pause and look at the opportunities that you have in your life to move into the yin. And be okay to sit in that stillness and figure it out. I'm not pretending stillness can't be uncomfortable. It can be. But I challenge you to sit there and figure out what will help you balance. Because in the end, we all just want to be happy. We be happy people. We want to nourish each other. We want to nourish the earth. So I challenge you today to figure out those activities and go for it. And be happy. Thank you.